Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you all so much for coming to today's Brown Bag Lunch presentation. I'm Jared, and I'm the curator here at the Amelia Island Museum of History. Now, before we get started today, I would like to ask everybody to please turn off or silence their cell phones so we can avoid any interruptions while our speaker is presenting. Before we begin our event today, I do have a few quick announcements about upcoming events and programs happening at our museum. This month's Third on Third lecture will be presented by Dr. Kevin Kokemore, who will join us next Friday, January 12th, to speak about his new book, La Florida, Catholics, Conquerors, and Other American Origin Stories. Dr. Kokemore will discuss the rich Spanish history of the Georgia Sea Islands and North Florida coast, from the beginnings of La Florida to the destruction of the Spanish missions. This third on third lecture will take place one week earlier in the month than our usual third on third lectures do. So mark your calendars now for the evening of next Friday, January 12th. February 7th, Brown Bag Lunch will be presented by museum docent Margaret Newton and will be discussing the French period of Amelia Island's history. This short-lived period of French Huguenot control was unlike any other time in our history and raised the first of our eight flags over this island. As the year progresses, our docents will continue to tell the chronological story of Amelia Island, so you don't want to miss this second installment in our 2024 Brown Bag Lunch calendar. Join us on February 7th for that event. Now, today we kick off the 2024 Brown Bag Lunches with a discussion of the first people to live in this area during the modern era. I have the honor of introducing today's speaker, who is a regular presence here at the museum. Dr. Bill Birdsong was born in Jacksonville and returned to our area 40 years later, in the meantime gaining some significant experience both as a medical doctor and obstetrician. Since returning to our area and becoming involved in the museum, Dr. Birdsong has become a knowledgeable source on the region's Timucuan history. Today, he'll share some of that knowledge with us. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Birdsong. I don't think I recognize myself. <laughs> so this is the third on third, the third six. That works pretty well, I see what you think about it. I gave a similar talk about eight years ago, but at that time, the subject wasn't very controversial. It's very controversial now, so just bear with me. I'm going to stay away from any moral things, political, or even my personal opinion. So just go with me if you would. <coughs> now, I'm not an academician. This is just something I've read about as well. We'll be talking about the Burbash, Two Spirits, and the Third Six. All mean the same thing. The Burbash is an Arabic word and it was used in anthropology in the 19th century, and still today, but it's considered somewhat derogatory. So the Native Americans in North America came up with the term two spirits, and that's the word that's being used today. Third sex means the same thing, but it gives too much of a biological uh, aspect to it <coughs> that we try to avoid that. Okay, there. We tested this yesterday and it worked fine. <laughs> yeah. Because nobody was here. <laughs> so I'll be talking about the Tabuqua people at the time of contact, what gender is and how that differs from biology, and a little bit of biology. If I get this like what Hey, Florida's indigenous people in northeast Florida were the Tabuqua. And they lived from Ocala, South Georgia, the Atlantic, to Tallahassee. And they were mainly a language group. But they had been here for about 4,000 years, is what recent research has shown. At first contact, they estimated there were 200,000 of them. It was a very big group. But after contact, they began to die off. And I'm sure you know the reason they lacked immunocompetence to European diseases, such as smallpox, measles, influenza, typhus. The Europeans had been exposed to these diseases for millennia, so they had developed some immunity to it. These diseases weren't in the New World. 
So they had no immunity, and they very quickly began to <coughs> fall. When the Spanish left in 1763, because the British came in, they took all the Buku with them to Cuba. They were that few, <coughs> they could just take them with them. The Tumuco cosmology, how they see the world, is divided into three parts. It seems like all cultures take three parts to this. I'm not really sure why. The upper world, pure spiritual ancestors, gods, the ground world, where we live our everyday life. And for some reason, birds are seen as the messengers from the ground world to the upper world, which is good on the greenway. <laughs> <laughs> and then the underworld. <coughs> polluted, evil, dangerous. Some people, though, could work with this underworld without risk, and that's who, of course, we'll concentrate on. This is a bird dancer. Theodore Morris painted many, many paintings of the Tabuco. We had an exhibit. Did anyone see the exhibit we had several years ago? We had all the, many of his paintings here. They were exhibited for a full month. He's a very good painter. And the bird dancer represents that messenger bird that can go from the ground world up to the upper world. This would be a morning offering. You can see he's drinking something, offering it to the gods. In that upper left-hand corner, you can see a bird. He's flying the message up to the gods. Men dominated to move from society. They were the socio-political actors in society. They regulated the relations on the ground world. They interacted with allies, conducted warfare, and charged animals. Most of their activities, though, were discussed and decided on in the council house. And the women didn't go into this unless it was a special ceremony or a reason. So it was just for the men. Now, if you were to move with male going between villages, this is where you'd stay. And we were speaking with Tallahassee a few minutes ago. Go see the reconstruction of the Appalachian village if you're in Tallahassee. They built a council house there that will seat 2,000 people. They think that was the size that it was at that time. Women, of course, were important. And here's another one of Morris's uh, paintings. They had a more of a socio-religious function than the men. They did the food, the drink, the children. They had a link to the ancestors. They could do things with underworld things, but not all. It was too great of a risk. But someone did be able to do that, and of course, that's the purpose of the talk. This is a mourning ceremony. The chief has died. So all the people are gathered around the grave, and they wail three times a day for six months. And the women were very important in that. Now, the two spirits, they embody aspects of male and female. They bridge a gap between male and female. Their intercessors are both the upper world and the lower world because they have special power where they can deal with things that are polluted. That's their gender role. Males and females avoid too close contact with these powerful forces because it's just too dangerous for them. But the two spirits could handle it. Some of the things they were involved with, like crafts, they would do the pottery, weaving, educating children. They could adopt children. Healing, the naming ceremony, names were very important in Tumbukan society. And they had other specific ceremonial roles. So they were a bridge between male and female. Now, in appearance, they looked a little different. They often were bare at the upper torso. Remember that the women wore those false skirts? They did too, but it was a little lower slung. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Everybody wore feathers, but the two spirits' feathers were just a little bit different from everybody else's. The most striking thing was their long hair. They grew it, swept it on their back, they could put adornments in it, and they could paint their face. This is one of the drawings I'm going to use to illustrate the talk. And are you familiar with these? This is based on Le Bon, who was a French cartographer who came here in 1562. 
and he wrote a narrative about the Tamukwa, but the drawings are engravings from debris, a Flemish engraver. A lot of controversy about how accurate these are. We had a <coughs> visitor in Jacksonville a couple of years ago who wrote the book, Painter and the Savage Lamb. Very interesting about Lemoyne. And after he talked, I said, did Lemoyne ever draw a human being? He said, don't think so. He drew the animals and the plants and things like that. So many of these drawings may be actually based on Native Americans from Brazil, but I think we could use it for illustration. But you see the upper torso is bare, the low slung skirt, and the long hair. Now, if we went to a Tarupa village at that time, would we know who was a two-spirit and who wasn't? Probably not at first. And then with time, we'd say, you know, some of these people just dress and act a little differently than men and women. Maybe they are a special group. And then we would realize we were dealing with the, two, the third sex. How about the Spanish? When they went there, they would probably undergo the same transformation, that everybody looks the same. No, this group looks a little different from the others. And eventually, they would identify them as the two spirits. What do you think they called them? Hermaphrodites. They were familiar with that term, that you're both a male and a woman. They could see that they, they dressed Men dressed as women, did women's work, and it was an inferior role to the Spanish. Now, a true hermaphrodite medically is someone who's born with gonads that are male and female, XX and XY. It's very uncommon. I have never seen it. But some babies are born with ambiguous genitalia, and you can't tell whether they're male or female without doing chromosomal studies. Over time, every <coughs> obstetrician sees that, but I, I don't think I've ever seen a true hermaphrodite. Now, where does hermaphrodite come from? It's a Greek myth. Hermaphrodite was a very handsome young man. His father was Hermes, his mother was Aphrodite. And Salcasus was a nymph that loved Hermaphrodite. She really loved him. Many of the ancient art is based on this. On one side of the pool, you see Hermaphrodite. On the other, Salcasus. He goes into the water. She sees him. She goes into the water, wraps her arms around him, and prays that they will be joined forever. And they were. <laughs> Suddenly, there weren't two people. There was one person with male and female parts. So that's where the whole idea of Hermaphrodite that the Spaniards would have used as a term for the two spirits. They were special people. It was thought that the gods had made them and given them special powers, particularly in dealing with something that was polluted, something that was dangerous. They participate in male and female roles, <coughs> but they have their own gender role. And gender, of course, is something that's socially assigned or chosen by the person as to how they see themselves and they could work in the dangerous areas of life. This is a war council, and you can see the middle of the bench are male. We know they're male because they have the top knot in their hair. Their hair is brought up and put into a top knot, and they're drinking casina, the black tea. This is made from yaku and holly, which grows around here, and is a heavily, heavily caffeinated drink. They would drink nothing but this for three days before fighting. <laughs> nothing but this while they were fighting. Raise their blood pressure, increase your heart rate, and you wouldn't get as fatigued. But look in the lower left corner. There's a big bat of a casino. The two spirits, the one with the long hair, is preparing the casino for the warriors. That was one of their gender roles. Now this is right before the battle. And you see the warrior chief instructing what they're going to do when they fight. You can see the two bats of Casina and all the weapons on the ground. Now the two spirits, like women, didn't fight. They were transporters. They brought the weapons, they brought the Casina to the battle. 
but they didn't actually participate in fighting themselves. They were not warriors. What they did was remove the dead and the injured from the battlefield. Again, transporters. And here we can see two, two spirits carrying the wounded to move along back to the village for treatment. Now, in the background, you see them carrying them on their back, wounded warriors. Now, if the warrior was bleeding, they would get blood on them, blood's polluting. So only a two-spirit could do this safely, because he had that special power. When they brought the dead back, they put them in a charnel house. That was to protect the body from animal predators, and they let them decompose. Or someone picked the flesh off the bones. And you know who that would be? It would be the two spirits, because they could do that safely where the males and females could not. So over the years, they'd collect many, many skeletons, and then when something important happened, like a chick <coughs> born or died, they'd have a big ceremony and bury all the bones at the same time. That's called an ossuary. And that particular <coughs> image is an ossuary that was on our island. And one of the odd things that I've never had explained, 80% of the bones are female. So there's something special about these women that they became the subject of the ossuary. <laughs> Healing was a very important thing to the two spirits. Now on the left, you see this man here. He's male because he's got the top knot. So he's probably a shaman but he's working with the two spirits with the illness, which of course is polluting. Many cultures see illness as coming from a foreign body of some kind that's embedded under the skin. And here he has a foreign body in his forehead. So the shaman has made an incision over it and then sucking it out to cure it. There was another part I was going to tell, but since it's lunchtime, I'm going to skip. <laughs> It deals with those two women on the other side. One of them is about 24 weeks pregnant, and the other one is breastfeeding, and it's something to do with what's in that bowl. We'll skip that. <laughs> now, in the back, you see a two-spirit. You can see the hair. He's treating that patient with tobacco. Tobacco was considered a medicinal drug uh, with the tobacco. Now, over on the right-hand side, it looks like a torture scene, but it's not. That man has a respiratory ailment of some kind. So what they've done is they've taken herbs, set them on fire, and he's breathing the smoke. They feel like an asthmatic with an inhaler. The two little kids fighting or something in the middle, I've never seen an explanation for. The Tumuku were hunters and gatherers. So when the fruit became ripe for the first time, they would collect it put it in these large baskets, which would be very heavy, and then the two spirits would carry it back to the village. They were very strong people. <coughs> and there was a big ceremony called the First Fruit Ceremony. Many cultures have an isolation hut, <coughs> and people are put in the hut when they have something that's polluting or dangerous to the other people. Illness, mysterious, dangerous, you would go in the isolation hut until you were well. It makes sense. Many illnesses are communicable, so by putting them in the isolation hut, you would protect the other people. But there are temporary times of being polluted also. Menstruation, labor, childbirth, and postpartum. They would go into the isolation hut until they were no longer a danger or a risk to the other people. Two spirits were generally selected prior puberty. And the parents say, is this just a phase he's going through, acting more effeminate, or is this real? Is he going to be a two spirit? Now, they, at that time, would probably encourage it because the two spirit had a special <laughs> place in the culture, an honored place. Now, who became a two spirit? Well, they might be noticed here, or there might be a question is this person really a two spirit in the making? They had a test. They would make a brush circle 
or stakes in the ground with an opening in it. Then they put the child in the middle of the circle and put a bow next to him and a basket next to him. Then they set it on fire. The child used to flee from the flames and he could take one object with him. If he took the bow, he'd be a warrior. If he took the basket, he'd be a two-spirit. I suspect the child knew this from having observed it and it would be a, a form of agency where he could choose to be a two-spirit. How did the Spanish respond to these people? Not real well. <laughs> Once they recognized them as a third sex, the Spanish didn't do real well with sex, so they stick the war dogs on them. It's the Native Americans in North America that developed the idea of the term, rather, two spirits. This was in 1991, before that bird ash had been more commonly used. And there are two spirit societies in many of the North American tribes. It turns out that North American Native Americans have many of the cultural traits of the two spirits. Men are dominant in this tribe, but like the Tamuqua, they're matrilineal. Things flow through the maternal line of descent, objects, whatever, and they're matrilocal. When you're married, you join your wife's family. So that has been maintained for a very long time. And then they have the two spirits, as did the Tamuqua. So we're dealing with sexual identity. How do you tell this? Is it physical appearance, how you look? Is it chromosomes? Is the gender, the social role, reflect who you actually are biologically in other ways? Are they just male, female, and in this case, two spirits? Now, some cultures, particularly in Southeast Asia, there's a third sex, fourth sex, fifth sex, sixth sex. There are many sexes. The Western concept, until recently, was seen as bipolar, opposites, linear. So you could put a rope on the ground, stretch it out, call one end male and one end female. That would be the traditional Western culture of who's male and who's female. They're opposites, they're not the same. Many places like the Native Americans, you would join the rope where male and female were together and there'd be an infinite number of points along the circle between male and female. There was no end and no beginning. And that's really found all over the world. They have a specialized work group. They're considered a different gender than male and female and they're spiritually sanctioned. The gods made them that way. Now the two spirits could, remember, raise children, adopt children. They could also, what we would call, marry. And they, they didn't marry each other, but they could marry males or females. That might seem odd to us, but it made perfect sense to them because they were neither male nor female. They were the third sex. So males or females would be eligible partners for marriage. It's widespread. There were 130 Native American tribes in North America with two-spirit societies. It's found in Bali, Siberia, India, Tahiti, Hawaii. It's all over. This is the distribution map in North America where they live, or where they're found, rather. The green are male two-spirits, the blue are female two-spirits, and the red, male and <coughs> female, could be two-spirits. You might be surprised, that actually, you may be more familiar with this or exposed to it than you think, because it's found in myth, like the Hermaphrodite myth, the art, movies, and in books. This is a, a painting from 1830, and I'm having a senior moment that I can't remember the name of the artist. Anybody help me? <laughs> it's called The Dance of the Bird Ash. And of course, the bird ash is the one with the long hair. And you can see the warriors dancing around him. It almost looks like they're threatening, but they're not. <clears throat> they're honoring the role of the bird ash. 
The painter, whose name I can't remember, <laughs> went all over the West painting cultural traits of Native Americans, fearing that they would be lost if he didn't do this. And there's a very famous photographer, Edward Curtis, who did the same thing with photographs. This is a movie that I can't find. It's called The Bird Ash. And I'm very curious as to whether the director had the actor portray what would be really a bird ash versus some sort of stereotype. Has anybody seen Little Big Man? Yeah. Did you see the two spirits, the bird ash in it? Did you recognize him as such? He befriended Dustin Hoffman, and he was obviously different from the other. That's not mine. <laughs> He's different from the males in his dress, in the feathers, if you knew what to look for, his way of speaking, and his actions. I think the director had a real good idea of what the two spiritual <coughs> gender was in Native American society, and he didn't go with the stereotypes that we see in satire. So I, I think they did a good job there. I was in anthropology back in the 60s. Uh, my area was Korea, <coughs> but we got exposed to all different cultures. <coughs> and this is Zuni. Dr. Will Roscoe lived with the Zuni Native Americans. That's New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. And he wrote a large ethnography on the Zuni culture, but he was fascinated by Weehua. This is the Zuni man-woman. I guess he had never heard of this before or seen it, so he took it very seriously and wrote a book just based on him and filled with photographs. This was used and is still used. I think the last edition I saw was in the 1990s. So anthropology students are still exposed to the Zuni man-woman. The gendered role was very similar to the Mukwa. Crafts, children, elders, healing, and you can see him weaving here. That would be part of his gendered role this was new to me. I had never heard of this until I started preparing the talk this time. This is the Japanese wakashu. Now, if you look at the figure on the right, you say, well, that's a man. He's got a shaved head. He's got a sword. The Japanese would recognize the kimono as being a male kimono. He's a samurai. How about the one on the left? A little more ambiguous. He's got long hair. <coughs> That's a shaved patch on his head, so part of the scalp is visible. Japanese would recognize this kimono as being appropriate to a young girl, so that's the wakashu. The difference in this is very similar in some ways to the two spirit, but it's time limited, which I had never <coughs> heard of before. This was in Edo, Japan, 1603 to 1867, so the wakashu was different in the way they did their hair, the way they did their dress and some of their gender role. This is the surprising part. It was a common stage for males. Between the age of seven and 20, many or most I have read have an episode of being a wakashu. And it could be chosen by the individual or signed by the family. They generally attach themselves to a male, an older male. The sexual implications, I'm not sure. But as they reached their 20s, they underwent jinpu, a coming of age ceremony. They shaved their head, started wearing male kimonos, and became an adult male. This disappeared after our Admiral Perry forced Japan to be open to the world. They come underwent a lot of Western influence. And they went from being a feudal country <coughs> to a nation state. They developed the legal definition of gender, what it is to be a male and what it is to be a female. By 1871, the women could not cut their hair. It had to be long. <coughs> the men had very closely cropped hair by law. Women had do domestic roles, men had masculine roles, primarily military. So it was a very, it was the ending of the war. We often associate our dress, though, with our maleness or femaleness, and everybody would recognize this guy as being in a male's tuxedo. 
They're congruent, male, tuxedo. But then we have Dr. Mary <coughs> Walker. Some of you may be familiar with her. She was a Civil War surgeon and was very active in the Civil War and given the Medal of Honor. After the war, she went on a lecture circuit, talking about her experiences, always dressed in a man's tuxedo, top hat, and wearing the medal. The government wanted the medal back, so they come and get it. <laughs> now, this is a World War I poster. The subject is obviously a young, attractive girl, but the uniform is a man's sailor outfit. So again, you've got opposites here. And she said, gee, I wish I were a man. I'd join the Navy. That's because we didn't have an Air Force. That was what I would have <laughs> <laughs> So those would be seen as opposites. But today, that's a combat uniform they're wearing. The one with the rifle is a woman, and she's being trained as a sniper. So they're not male and female uniforms anymore. I was in the era when we brought in a lot of women into the Air Force. We, we had to develop a special uniform for the pregnant ones. <laughs> and the ones doing guard duty had to carry a rifle because they couldn't get the pistol around them. <laughs> so, male and female, is it a clear categorization? Is it definitive what you see? Does the person always know? Are there only two biological categories? Well, we can look at chromosomes. We can look at the phenotype, that's the external appearance. We can look at the internal anatomy. And we can look at the gender, the role they're assigned or they have chosen for themselves. Now, the phenotype is an interesting one because the Congress had all the discussion of what is a woman thing that went on and on. And some said, well, it's simple, let's get them undressed and look. We find that's not always the way to go. <laughs> We have 46 chromosomes, 22 homologous pairs. Homologous means that the two chromosomes affect the same tissue, but they're a little different. And then we have the sex chromosomes, which are X, female, Y, male. But is that the whole story? And of course, it's not, or I wouldn't be giving the talk. <laughs> Either or, male or female, or is there different varieties of chromosomal complement? Well, if you lose a chromosome, <coughs> you may be XO. The X would be female. If you had the Y, you'd be a male. If you had the other X, you'd be a female. This is Turner syndrome, and you can see co compared to her sister, she has a webbed neck and a shield chest, normal intelligence, but can have problems with fertility. Which one is this? This is 47 chromosomes. You ever heard of this one? Yes. This is Jacob syndrome. This is XYY. Now, they discovered this in the 60s by doing chromosomal studies of prisoners. And they assumed, well, this is a super male. They're involved, involved with criminal activity. And it turned out that wasn't true. Later studies showed that they weren't. But they were impulsive. And impulsivity can lead you to crime and end up in the prison. So if you look at just prisoners, you'd make the assumption they're all prisoners, criminals. But they're not. The strange thing about these people is they're tall, very, very tall. The average height is 6'3". Makes you want to look at the National Basketball Association. <laughs> <laughs> Another 47 chromosome complement. XX, female, but you got the Y. The Y almost always makes male characteristics. These people also are tall, normal intelligence, decreased muscle mass, and somewhat more handsome than the average person. Sort of a feminine face, so they're very attractive. Some people have suggested some of the Hollywood actors are actually fine filters because they're so pretty. I mean, they're just very, very handsome people. <laughs> have you heard of this one, androgen insensitivity syndrome? This is the one that's important today in sports. When the baby is conceived, he starts out neutral. 
Now, if you looked at the fetus, you would say it's a female. But if they have XY gonads, eventually they secrete androgens and testosterone, and the tissue is converted to male. But if the tissue is insensitive, it doesn't respond. So internally, they're XY. Externally, they appear to be a normal woman. This is more common than you might think. Now, if you delivered a woman, a girl like this, you would tell the parents, you've got a nice looking girl. And she would be raised as a girl, but might have a little heavier musculature than most girls, under intense exercise, might develop a little more cardiac reserve than normal girls. And then at puberty, they would undergo some sexual, secondary sexual characteristics, breast, pubic hair, and all of that, but they wouldn't have a menstrual period. And that might lead them to the gynecologist. The initial exam would say, normal female. Speculative exam would show no cervix. Ultrasound would show no uterus, but internal gonads. If you biopsy though, they would be male XY. Now, in my era in the beginning, they recommended that they be surgically removed due to the risk of developing cancer due to the warmth of the body. Today, they're, they're more able to look and wait longer for that, to follow them and remove them only if it looks like there's a big risk. Where it's a problem, of course, today is in sports. Some of the people have become st very strong athletes. They never tried to get pregnant. And the assumption would be that they're just a normal female but internally they're male. So what they're trying to do now, it's been suggested, is try to suppress the testosterone down to female levels, because they have testosterone also. But the problem with that is from birth to puberty, they have the testosterone, so the musculature might be much heavier uh, from the very beginning. So uh, I, I don't think they really know what to do about this. When you say common, not common, okay. how common is it? You said it's. I was going to look all of the frequencies up and forgot to. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not extremely uncommon, but not common. And that, that runner, everybody knows this, we're not violating her privacy. They, they know that, that she is an androgen insensitivity. You can see the musculature is very masculine. This was to be my last slide, and you're going to have to bear with me. Something struck me four days ago, and I said, really? <laughs> In my youth, did I know anyone who would have been a two spirits if we had had that gender where I was raised? Now, I was, raised, I was born in 1941, raised in the Deep South culture, and we had people who were a little more effeminate than other people, but they weren't given the gender role and then honored. They were called sissies. Have, have you ever heard that word? Yes. It was very common when I was in school, and some activities were sissified. I don't think anyone under the age of 30 even knows what the word means anymore. I think that's completely gone, particularly in today's environment when we're just reevaluating all of this. But it's a gendered role at that time, but it wasn't honored. It wasn't a positive role. These people would be more likely to be in the band rather than the football team. They more likely would like art. They'd be very good at languages. Language is something that women generally do much better at. They would be males, but they would have that ability. They might be in the drama club or sing in the choir. Later, their occupation might be something that was usually staffed more by women than men. Now, they're going to talk about the 1950s and 40s, not, not now. So they might be hairdressers, elementary school teachers, nurses. And then I looked in the mirror. And you can see where this is going. <laughs> I played in the band. <laughs> I play in the community band right now. <laughs> I played trombone poorly for 70 years. When I just enlisted in the Air Force in 1962, the Air Force looked at me, gave me a test, and said, language. <laughs> I became a Korean linguist. 
but I'm a fighter pilot. <laughs> I started at the University of Florida and was encouraged to take a very masculine course, engineering. I lasted one semester <laughs> and later ended up with a BA and MA in anthropology, a soft science. In med school, they let us work in the emergency room and I had one patient that had a foreign body in his arm. That was the first incision I ever made. I didn't suck it out like the shame of the arm, <laughs> but I removed the bullet from the Atlanta gangbanger. So I removed a foreign body to make someone well. <laughs> I went into OBGYN. It's different now. But earlier, the labor and delivery suite was like an isolation hub. Men didn't go in the delivery room. It was too dangerous. <laughs> we went in the delivery room, delivered the babies, often were covered in blood and bodily fluids and all this. It didn't bother us. We were too strong, <laughs> too spiritual. In the military, my last year, 1991, was the first Gulf War. They mobilized over several hundred of us to go to Europe to open a contingency hospital to treat the sick and the injured. We weren't warriors, we were healers. We couldn't fight. In fact, we were given a card, I think it was issued by the UN, but I'm not sure, and it says the undersign is a non-combatant. So we were overrun, and we never were, of course, and taken by the enemy. We showed them the card and said, I'm a non-combatant. <laughs> they treat me differently. And of course, they, I'm sure they would have done that. <laughs> Today, at this advanced age, my primary interest, art and artistic photography. So if you go back to that old, old joke about the country boy, when I was young, I couldn't spell Burdash, and I are one. <laughs> That artist here, I think it had George Catlin. Catlin, it's an artist, of course, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> the older I get, the more of this happens. I really noticed it. Just like my wife, Susie. Susie. <laughs> That's why we had smartphones now. What's that? That's why we had smartphones now. I should have pulled that baby out. <laughs> Curtis, I'm very familiar with. Uh, he, he has a book, Life in the Sh World of the Shadow World or something. It's history of taking photographs of Native Americans all over the West. And you get a book about this thick. He documented almost every tribe that we have. Fantastic thing. And they'll have exhibits of his photographs. It, we saw one at the museum uh, just recently. Yes, ma'am. Why do you think the shaman was male and not a two spirit? Mm -hmm. Did that do with leadership or something? I, I don't know, but I think Debris may not have known this. And he said, I'll throw in one top knot guy and the rest uh, two spirits. I don't think he had any concept of it. <clears throat> and they said many of his uh, engravings were based on Brazilian Indians mm -hmm. rather than uh, Native American. Down at the first station of the Eight Flags tour are several of Morris's paintings. And those may be somewhat imaginative also. The, the tattoos, the painting patterns, I don't, I don't think they really, anyone really knows what, what they have. Although one guy wrote a dissertation, a thesis on the tattoos of the Tarupa. <laughs> And then the Lanage, the head archaeologist at the University of Florida, said, we don't know whether it's tattooed or not. The Brazilians were. They had heavy tattoos. But Bill, you talked a lot about young boys getting this test to decide this. But what about women? What about young girls? As far as I know, there weren't any female two spirits. Remember the map I showed showed male, female, male, and female. And uh, they were much rarer. I, I don't know why. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we got through it. Yes. <laughs>